Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Divided, Why We're Living in an Age of Walls by Tim Marshall. So, uh, I'll read you the blurb, I guess. You have a blurb? We do have a blurb. So, non-fiction. Walls are going up. Nationalism and identity politics are on the rise once more. Thousands of miles of fences and barriers have been erected in the past ten years, and they are redefining our political landscape. There are many reasons why we erect walls, because we are divided in many ways. Wealth, race, religion, politics... In Europe, the ruptures of the past decade threaten not only European unity, but in some countries, liberal democracy itself. In China, the parties need to contain the divisions wrought by capitalism will define the nature's future. In the USA, the rationale for the Mexican border wall taps into the fear that the USA will no longer be a white majority country in the course of this century. Understanding what has divided us, past and present, is essential to understanding much of what's going on in the world today. Covering China, the USA, Israel and Palestine, the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, Africa, Europe and the UK, best-selling author Tim Marshall presents a gripping and unflinching analysis of the fault lines that will shape our world for years to come. Let us begin by going into China and I will read you a few excerpts from that that I found interesting. So here we go. The Great Wall has played a huge role in the popular imagination of both the Chinese and the rest of the world. Although some historians argue that the Europeans were more obsessed by it than the Chinese themselves and that this, and that this contributed towards awareness of and identification with the structure in China itself. So the wall has been instrumental in defining China from outside as well as within its own confines. So that idea that the Chinese kind of appreciate the wall almost because the West does rather than because they themselves do, you know? I thought this was quite a good quote here. Uh, President Z. Bearing in mind he's not the, probably the best person because he was obviously the Chinese government and the Chinese government aren't known for free speech and whatnot. But he said, uh, just as one loves one's own eyes, one must love ethnic unity. This was when he was calling for, you know, less discrimination, etc. I think this is interesting too in terms of how the Chinese uh, economy works. It was, and still is, a race against the clock. It is also a strategy that relies on an economic policy that must maintain its relentless pace, no matter what. China has to continue making things. The world has to keep buying these things. If the demand drops, China cannot afford, as a normal capitalist system might, to stop making these things. It must keep up production, keep the factories open, subsidise the banks, no matter the surplus. Try to dump some abroad at fire sale prices, sell even more to the part of the domestic population which can afford them. Just don't let the system stop, because if it does, so might the entire country. This is an interesting hit thing here as well in terms of the one child policy. So, another problem the government faces is that of an ageing population. This isn't unique to China, of course. But it is a particular issue for China because of the one child only policy, which means that the population is ageing much faster than in other countries. In less than a decade, the number of elderly will rise from 200 million to 300 million. Is the government prepared for such a change in demographics? Its economic policy has been reliant on a young and plentiful labour force. Proportionally, this pool of available labourers, and taxpayers, will get smaller at the same time as the financial burden of providing care to the ageing population increases, putting economic progress at risk. Again, the solution is not clear. One option is to raise the retirement age by five years, but that simply postpones the problem and in the meantime creates another. The college graduates, the education system is churning out want jobs. Unemployment and lack of promotion are already difficulties and will only be exacerbated if the older generation retires later. The alternative is to ensure that the social services can provide pensions and drop the one child policy. The latter was done in 2015 but the government is still looking for ways to fund the former. So let's move on to the United States. We have a, here a little thing as well, which, because I think it's good to have this where it's like fairly even in terms of how Republicans and Democrats in the United States have uh, approached the issue of the Mexican border. So I'm just going to read this out. In the early 2000s, with George Bush in office and in the wake of 9-11, the US government launched a full border fortification program, imposing an unprecedented degree of separation along most of the boundary. Congress approved the Secure Fence Act, agreeing that another 700 miles could be built. Among those voting for the measure were Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, but even after, those but even after these improvements and with cross-party support, the fence was, as Border Patrol spokesman Mike Scioli described it in 2008, little more than a speed bump in the desert. When President Obama came to the White House, there were over 600 miles of barrier, and he kept building extending the fence, in some regions double layering it, occasionally even triple layering. During his term in office there was also a significant increase in the number of forced removals of illegal immigrants compared to the Bush years. This should not come as too much of a surprise given his speech to the Senate in April 2006, when he described the immigration system as broken, allowing a flood of illegals into America. So this is his quote. The American people are a welcoming and generous people, but those who enter our country illegally, and those who employ them, disrespect the rule of law. 
And because we live in an age where terrorists are challenging our borders, we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented and unchecked. Americans are right to demand better border security and better enforcement of the immigration laws. And before any guest worker is hired, the job must be made available to Americans at a decent wage with benefits. So we've moved on to the Middle East now, and I think these statistics are interesting, but also alarming. So it says, in 2014, just 5% of the global population lived in the Arab world, but suffered 45% of the world's terrorist attacks, 68% of conflict-related deaths, and housed 58% of its refugees. In some countries, the whole nation has fallen apart. In others, the cracks are showing, and there are those where the divisions are hidden beneath the surface and could reappear at any moment. The wars and uprisings have laid bare the huge rifts in the Arab-dominated countries. There remains a sense of Arab unity, insofar as they share a space, a language, and to an extent a religion. But the prospect of pan-Arab unification remains a distant dream. I think it was interesting here, a report... Um by, uh, so it says, the Arab Human Development Report 2002, written by a number of eminent Arab intellectuals led by the Egyptian statistician Nader Fagani and sponsored by the UN Development Programme. And it said, uh, they concluded, the region is richer than it is developed. I'm very sorry, we may have lost a very small part of this review because my footage went AWOL. However, um, I was talking about the Middle East and um, yeah, I wanted to read this. Because I think this is quite surprising, this statistic. The lack of civil rights and freedom of speech and the blatant censorship manifest in most Arab countries in turn meant that, despite reasonable spending on education, the money was misused and the results were poor. The report said that in the past 1,000 years, fewer books have been translated into Arabic than are translated into Spanish in Spain in just one year. Internet use was restricted to just 0.6% of the population. That internet use has gone up, but other problems haven't been solved, unfortunately, as well. There's also this report here from the UN, and this is talking about uh, the Arab nations, but I think is equally applicable all over the world, you know. Young people are gripped by an inherent sense of discrimination and exclusion, thus leading to a weakening of their commitment to preserving government institutions. Yeah. Alright, up next we've got the Indian subcontinent, and this has got a quote from Ursula K. Le Guin at the start, from the dispossessed, which I thought was quite an interesting way to start. Like all walls, it was ambiguous, two-faced. What was inside it and what was outside it depended upon which side you were on. And each of the sections have got like a, an image here, you know, to start them off as well. So just some interesting facts here about India's fences. So on India's frontier with Bangladesh is the longest border fence in the world. It runs along most of the 2,500 mile boundary which India wraps around its much smaller neighbour. The only part of Bangladesh completely free of it is its 360 mile long coast at the Bay of Bengal. The fence zigzags from the bay northwards, along mostly flattish ground, up towards the more hilly country near Nepal and Bhutan, takes a right turn along the top of the country, then drops down south again, often through heavily forested areas, back to the sea. The territories on each side are heavily populated, and in many areas the ground is cultivated as close to the barrier as possible, which means the crops grown often touch the divide. And I think this is awful. This kind of shows some of the problems that these fences and you know border patrols can cause. So it says here... Um, Despite these measures, the Indian fence fails to stop people from trying to cross. They continue to do so despite the barbed wire and despite the fact that border guards have shot dead hundreds of people attempting to get into India, as well as many others wanting to return to Bangladesh surreptitiously after being in India illegally. Among them, in 2011, was 15-year-old Falani Khatun. Falani's family had been working illegally in India without passports or visas due to the legal complexity and costs of obtaining either. In order to return home for a family visit, Falani and her mother had paid a smuggler $50 to get them across. Just after dawn, with a border fence shrouded in mist, she began climbing a bamboo ladder placed against it by the smuggler. Her shawar kameez snagged on the barbed wire. She panicked and began to shout to her father for help. Following a number of terrorist infiltrations, India's border security force, BSF, were under orders to shoot to kill, and a border guard followed orders. It was a slow death. She remained dangling on the fence, bleeding but still alive, for several hours. As the sun rose and the mist lifted, she could be seen and heard crying out for water before finally succumbing to her wounds. The shockingly violent drawn-out death of such a young girl drew international attention and condemnation at the shoot-to-kill policy. Inevitably, attention waned, but the, but the politics remain, and so does the fence. Her death stands as testimony to the human cost of such barriers. India is not unique in this. There has been an increase of such deaths around the world. Dr. Rhys Jones point out that 2016 set the record for border deaths, 7,200 globally, because of the increase in border security. So I thought this was an interesting little thing as well, looking at the impact of climate change and how 
basically we're going to have more and more climate refugees just by the very nature of what's going on in the world. There are already climate refugees in many parts of the world, and there are destined to be tens of millions more, most heading for urban areas, as even small changes to climate can have catastrophic results for local populations. In Africa, for example, droughts over the last few decades have created severe famine in many regions, while the Sahara Desert is also expanding slowly southwards. But in Asia, climate refugees are mostly trying to escape the floods. A 2010 study published by the London School of Economics suggests that of the top 10 coastal cities most exposed to flooding, nine were in Asia. Dakar was third behind Kolkata and Mumbai. When you apply this predicted future to a country such as Bangladesh, where modern healthcare is scarce and education levels low, it is obvious that if a fifth of the land is flooded, and some of the rest is no longer fit for agriculture, then huge numbers of people will move. Some will try to get to the west, but millions, especially the poorest, will head for India and run up against the fence and the border guards. At this point, India would have an even greater humanitarian and political problem on its hands than it already struggles with. And then we have this little bit with, with the border between, I, I think, is it Pakistan and Kashmir? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to read this out. Yeah, Pakistan and India. The situation in Kashmir is more formal. Even though there is no agreement on where the border should be, in theory, behaviour on each side of the line of control is regulated by the Karachi Agreement of 1949. It says that there should be no defence construction within 500 yards of each side of the line, a stipulation frequently ignored by both sides. The fragile ceasefire is also frequently broken. There are not only cross-border shootings between Indian and Pakistani regular forces, but New Delhi accuses Islamabad of sponsoring terrorist groups to cross into the Indian-controlled side in order to foment violence and even carry out attacks on Indian cities. Since the early 1980s, the two countries have engaged in sporadic artillery duels high up on the Shiachen Glacier, close to the line of control. Located on the Karakoram Range in the Himalayas, this is the world's highest combat zone. At almost 20,000 feet above sea level, Pakistani and Indian soldiers face off against each other in one of the most climactically hostile areas possible. Tours of duty at the higher levels are only 12 weeks long, as lack of oxygen can prevent sleep and cause hallucinations. The soldiers exchange fire but there are more casualties from frostbite than from high explosives. And then we move on to Africa, and I'm just gonna start with this little quote from the beginning of this chapter. There's a wall at the top of Africa. It is a wall of sand, of shame, and of silence. Let me get some more context here. The Moroccan wall runs for 1,700 miles through Western Sahara and into parts of Morocco. The whole construction separates what Morocco terms its southern provinces along the Atlantic coast from the free zone in the desert interior, an area the Sahrawi people call the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. It is built of sand piled almost seven feet high, with a backing trench and millions of landmines stretching several miles into the desert on each side of the barrier. It is thought to be the longest continuous minefield in the world. Every three miles or so, there is a Moroccan army outpost containing up to 40 troops, some of whom patrol the spaces between the bases, while two and a half miles back from each major post are rapid reaction mobile units, and behind those, artillery bases. The length of the wall is also dotted with radar mass, which can see up to 50 miles into the free zone. All of this is intended to keep fighters from the Sahrawi military force, called the Polisario Front, well away from the wall and the areas Morocco considers its territory. I also thought these statistics were quite enlightening as well, so... Africa is the poorest continent in the world. Globalisation has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but at the same time the gap between the rich and the not rich has widened. The division is particularly stark in Africa, where seven of the ten most unequal countries are to be found. Across the continent are modern cities rapidly filling with skyscrapers, multinational companies and a growing middle class. But in all these burgeoning urban centres, alongside the wealthy live the incredibly poor, who might be scraping by on less than two dollars a day. A World Bank study in 2016 found that the percentage of Africans living in poverty had declined from 56% in 1990 to 43% in 2012. But the number of people living in those conditions had actually increased from 280 million to 330 million due to the growth in population. All right, I've got some more of this to read out to you guys. So where are we? I can't remember where I got into the last video. Apparently we are, we've hit Europe. So obviously we've got some stuff on the Berlin Wall. So I thought this paragraph about the Berlin Wall was really interesting. The divides in modern Germany are nowhere near as stark as they were during the Cold War, and some are due to factors that predate the communist-capitalist split. However, the outlines of the wall and the Iron Curtain can still be seen, and can still be felt. You can see physical remnants along Bernardstrasse, at the Niederkirchenstrasse, at the Bundestag, the Berlin Parliament, and at the War Museum situated at what was Checkpoint Charlie. At the flea markets, you can even buy a bit of concrete chiselled out of the wall on that famous night in 1989 although the chances of it being genuine are slim given that the volume sold would have made the wall one of the biggest structures ever erected. 
Either way, you can take home a little grey symbol of history, of human suffering, of the ultimate political division of the 20th century that split Europe in a way that seems unimaginable to many people nowadays. I was alive when the Berlin Wall came down, actually, because I was born June 89, and I think it came down in December 89. So, uh... Fun fact for you, I guess, if you care. Oh, anyway, let me know in the comments if you were alive when the Berlin Wall came down. Big kudos to you if you remember when the Berlin Wall came down. So we have this little bit here as well. Across the EU, leaders have been looking for ways to manage the levels of immigration and discontent within the population. In 2016, Denmark introduced a bill under which asylum seekers arriving in the country with cash and jewellery could keep only 10,000 kroners, about £1,000 worth. Anything above this had to be used to contribute towards the cost of basic maintenance, healthcare and accommodation. Sentimental items such as wedding rings were exempt after comparisons were made to the treatment of Jews by Nazi Germany. Some German states and the Swiss had already, quietly, introduced similar measures, although the practice is less widespread. The Swiss, for example, recorded only 112 cases where assets were taken, out of, 40, out of 45,000 refugees who arrived in 2015. I thought this, these were some interesting statistics about like the prevalence of you know, followers of the Muslim faith uh, across Europe. So I'm going to read these two paragraphs here. European Muslims actually make up a fairly small proportion of populations across the EU. The most exhaustive study prior to the latest migrant refugee crisis was by the Pew Research Centre in 2010. It found that in the EU, the largest Muslim populations are in Germany, 4.8 million, and France, 4.7 million. This constitutes 5.8% and 7.5% of their respective populations. The UK share was 2.9 million, 4.8%. Sweden, 430,000, 4.6%. And Greece, 610,000, 5.3%. The numbers are rising. There has been a steady 1% increase per decade over the last 30 years. So while 6% of the EU population, 13 million people, were Muslim in 2010, the figure was projected to rise, prior to the mass influx of 2015, to 8% by 2030 but the numbers are still much lower than many people believe to be the case. The misperception may be due to a number of reasons. For example, some representatives of Muslim communities, often self-styled, are far more vocal about religious issues than any other community, and therefore more noticeable through media coverage. However, a bigger factor is probably that there are highly visible concentrations of ethnicities in urban centres. Approximately 20% of Stockholm is Muslim, 13% of Amsterdam, 15% of Brussels and 12% of Cologne. It would be easy for many people to assume from what they see around them in their daily lives that the rest of their country was similar. For example, a UK government report in late 2016 found that in overwhelmingly Muslim parts of northern cities such as Bradford, Muslims themselves thought the UK was well over 50% Muslim. I think this is one of the, I don't know, one of the most middle class things I think I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> let me just read this out. While having a very strong sense of their own identity, most people in the British Isles get along fine, subscribing to the same values and to the overarching idea of the Union. There are, of course, stories of anti-English sentiment being expressed in both Wales and Scotland, and it does happen. I was once effectively refused service in a working men's club in Perthshire. My dad's band used to, used to play in working men's clubs. I kind of grew up in them. Here, I think, is something that could be useful for Americans, I guess. I think it's pretty widely known in the UK now, but you will definitely find British people, and indeed residents of the United Kingdom, who do not know the difference between the two. <laughs> Northern Ireland is the smallest of the four main UK regions, representing just 5.7% of the land area and, with 1.8 million people, 2.9% of its population. It was created in 1921 after the British government divided Ireland into two separate jurisdictions. Southern Ireland became independent in 1922, while Northern Ireland remained part of the UK. Some people think that the terms United Kingdom and Great Britain are interchangeable, but the latter refers only to England, Scotland and Wales, and a few small adjacent islands, whereas the UK also comprises Northern Ireland. The full title is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I think this is another thing that Americans don't really necessarily get, which is the British class system. So again, I'm going to read this out. One of the clearest demarcations in British society has always been that of class, and this remains the case today. It might be less clear cut than in the past. A middle class teacher may well earn less than a working class plumber. A train driver may earn more than someone in middle management. And there is greater social mobility and diversity. However, most social mobility studies find that men and women who attended private schools and then one of the Russell Group universities, the UK's 24 leading universities, still dominate the highest positions in the land in numbers way above their proportion of the population as a whole. The case can be made that these people are in fact the most highly educated and in many instances the best people for their jobs. But it can also be argued that this system prevents each country from finding and utilising the best of its talents. Only 7% of the UK population attended independent schools, but they dominate the highest levels in the judiciary, the armed services, the BBC, the major corporations, the civil service and both major political parties. For example, 55% of the civil service's permanent secretaries are 
For example, 55% of the civil service's permanent secretaries are privately educated, as are 71% of the top judges. As are seventy-one percent of the top judges. About half of the UK's newspaper columnists are privately educated. A 2014 Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission report found that on the BBC's influential Question Time program, forty-three percent of guests had attended Oxford or Cambridge University. And there are other factors at play that help perpetuate the imbalance across society. Many major companies offer only unpaid internships, effectively barring a young person from applying unless their parents can subsidise their living costs. Consequently, the better off, many of them privately educated gain the experience and contacts that help them succeed in the world of work. I love this as well. This is a George Orwell quote from a 1930 essay, The Lion and the Unicorn. I have actually come across this before, but I wanted to share it anyway. England is perhaps the only great country whose intellectuals are ashamed of their own nationality. In left-wing circles, it is always felt that there is something slightly disgraceful in being an Englishman and that it is a duty to snigger at every English institution, from horse racing to suet puddings. I think that's how you say it. It is a strange fact, but it is unquestionably true that almost any English intellectual would feel more ashamed of standing to attention during God Save the King than of stealing from a poor box. I think this, these, last, these last two paragraphs are what I'm going to end on here as well. In, in a 2017 foreign affairs essay, Nathan Smith, assistant professor of economics at Fresno Pacific University School of Business, described this open borders idea as a regime of nearly complete freedom of migration worldwide, with rare exceptions for preventing terrorism or the spread of contagious disease. Ending migration controls in this way would increase liberty, reduce global poverty and accelerate economic growth. But more fundamentally, it would challenge the right of governments to regulate migration on the arbitrary grounds of sovereignty. The more efficient allocation of labour would result in global increases in pro productivity, leading the world economy to nearly double in size. This increased economic activity would, moreover, disproportionately benefit the world's poorest people. Smith argues that by opening borders we could end world poverty, and therefore that it is, in a way, a moral duty for those of us in the West to do so, especially in terms of righting historical wrongs. There is even a view that the practice of citizenship within a state is as violent and discriminatory as the slave trade, because it places citizens' rights over human ones and thus legitimises the idea that some people are more human than others. If this were to happen, the strain on resources in the West would be immense. Welfare state systems, for example, would effectively have to be dismantled. Smith recognises that open borders would probably lead to a large increase in visible extreme poverty in the West, but counters that impoverishment by Western standards looks like affluence to most of the world, and that the benefits to millions outweigh the inconveniences and downsides for Westerners. He kind of disagrees with that. I'm kind of more on the side of that guy. I'm like, yeah, that, you know, it does sound the fairest thing, the, you know, the, the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people without inconvenience in the few too much, you know? All in all, I really enjoyed this. I gave this a four out of five and thought there was some fascinating food for thought in it. And uh, I would recommend it. I have seen some criticism and some negative reviews and stuff, but I don't agree with those guys. I gave it a four out of five. So, yeah. So, there you have it. Those are my thoughts and highlights of Divided, Why We're Living in an Age of Walls by Tim Marshall. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book. And if you were alive slash remember the Berlin Wall coming down, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.